You're listening to the Eden Body Art Studios podcast, or the Eden BAS pod for short. My name is Colton James, and I'm one of the owners of the studio. I host this podcast with my wife and co-owner, Deanna James. The artists and clients we get to work with every day make Eden unlike any other tattoo studio on the planet. Some of them we've known for years, and some of them we just met, but we want to introduce them to you, the listener. The idea is for us, and for you, to get to know them a little better. Take a listen. You're going to love it. Hello, babe. Hello. <laughs> it's so <laughs> nice to be here from the uh, kitchen. Yeah, it's, it's a long... Uh, all, all the way to upstairs. Yeah, it's a long walk, but I'm really glad to be here and spill the beans. Yeah, welcome to um, my man cave, which I guess is, is no longer exclusive to me now that I guess we're doing this. I guess we share it now. Um, so for the first episode, I wanted to sit down with Deanna. Um, I know a lot of this already, but I think it's a good opportunity for everyone else to hear from her and kind of get kind of the inside scoop on her career and, and what's been going on and, and her plans for the future. Yeah, I, I definitely, um, I think I'm at a point where I, I really, I kind of want to talk about my whole, uh, my whole life, you know, and how I got here and, and then share with everybody. So I'm happy yeah. to be doing this. Yeah, so anyone listening probably is pretty familiar with Deanna's resume already, but just to give everyone a brief refresher, um, Deanna is a graduate of Booker T. Washington's Visual Arts Program. She was a winner on Ink Master Angels and finished in the top five of season 10 of Ink Master. She was also named Best Tattoo Artist of 2018 by the Dallas Observer Magazine, Um, and in 2021, she opened her first studio, Eden. She's won countless awards at tattoo conventions all over the country, and her work is followed by nearly 200,000 followers on Instagram. It's a pretty impressive resume. You make me sound a lot cooler than I feel most of the time. <laughs> I don't think I make you sound cool enough. <laughs> um, but yeah, I kind of wanted to uh, just let everyone kind of uh, experience what you've what you've been through uh, since the very beginning. So I want to back up. Oh my goodness! All the way before all that uh, to when you first first started doing art. Oh my goodness. So when I, when I started drawing, I know that my parents still have a piece of paper of the first face I drew when I was around three years old, three or four, three. I was really, and it's, you know, I say it's a, it's a face, but you know, I, I, I think, uh, it's interpreted differently by it's everybody. An, they say it was a face. Abstract face. It was an abstract face. Definitely. Well, um, I've never drawn a face. So <laughs> drawing one at three, that's, it's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, there was something in there. There was, yeah. But uh, I, I definitely, um, one of the things I found, you know, I, I just realized that, you know, during recess when everybody was out playing uh, in the yard during kindergarten, I, I loved staying inside and making books. And I, and I would draw pictures and I would write and I would, that's what I loved doing in my free time while everyone else was, you know, doing cool stuff outside I was kind of of the loner on the inside and um, it was really meditative for me I think that's why uh, art stuck with me so much is that when I do art it's really the one of the few times where I completely zone out and I kind of forget time exists and sometimes I'll forget to breathe and it's yeah it really calms me down especially like always being an anxious kid it was just a it was very meditative Would you say that it's still meditative for you, even though it's your career now? Yeah, absolutely. You know, if I'm designing or painting or drawing, I still get really zoned out. And sometimes, you know, I remember being on my iPad when we were driving to uh, the lake and I was supposed to give you directions and I (laughs) forgot to give you directions (laughs) while you were driving while I was, you know, designing next to you. And, you know, I I just, I forget the world around me still. Um, But... Yeah, so like the very first things that I was drawing uh, when I realized that I really liked drawing was, you know, Pokemon and, and stuff like that. And um, I did my first still life when I was seven years old, which my parents still have. It's like a little <laughs> shoe. It was my favorite shoe that I ever got. And it was iridescent. And it was the first time I drew from life and I tried shading. And Yeah. And, and your parents have obviously been so supportive the entire way. Have they ever thrown out anything that you've made? Uh, <laughs> uh, when I was a teenager, I, I went through a rebellious stage and I, I, I drew a, a picture of these naked women snorting Coke off of other women. And my mom threw that away in the trash. I had to dig it out. 
Um, but it's funny because I didn't do drugs around that age. I just was drawing weird <laughs> shit. Well, well, I rescind my question, but they've been mostly supportive. Yes. <laughs> Otherwise, the they've beginning. been extremely supportive. <laughs> Um, yeah, because when I was seven and, and, you know, they really, they saw how much I loved drawing. They, they, um, really pushed me. And honestly, my first and second grade teacher, she was the same, you know, she taught me both grades, Miss Woodbury. Um, she was the one who even recommended Booker T to my mom because she saw that I was, you know, I was drawing a lot. And at that point I, um, even won a competition, um, in my whole, you know, and out of my whole school for the cotton bowl it was like we had to draw a little postcard and stuff as a competition and i won yeah so i guess um seven that would have been around first grade when miss woodbury was teaching you yeah yeah and um about when did you start taking art classes um because she let your parents know right like hey deanna's yeah. got some got some there's some potential here you know yeah yeah so definitely she she told my parents about booker t it was like you got to get her in there in high school and, and this was first grade uh-huh good lord i wish i was they were that good at something <laughs> at all <laughs> but especially that young yeah they they were they were planned out well you're good on a lot of things so um yeah i they my mom put me in my first oil painting class around third or fourth grade wow um yeah but you know before that I loved art class in in elementary school you know as well and my art teacher then Miss Ford actually prepared my portfolio to get accepted into the West Junior High for visual arts which was another arts you know middle now, school so that was like the precursor to Booker T the arts arts yeah. middle school yeah so, so how do you go about getting in that? You just have a, have a portfolio from all your arts classes? Yeah. So in sixth grade, I had a, you know, Miss Ford helped me put together a portfolio of um, a number of pieces. I forget how many I had to do. And then I had to present it um, to West Junior High and I got accepted. And um, yeah. And then from there, they prepared me to go to Booker T. And I was the only one who got accepted, especially because um, it was hard for me and for everybody because we weren't in the district. You know, if you're in the Dallas school district, you can get into Booker T a lot easier. Oh. But if you're not, you're automatically put on the wait list. So you got to be, you know. The wait list for Booker T. Yeah. Gotcha. But you just got in because your mm -hmm. portfolio was that good? Yeah. Well, now, you know, I mentioned how your parents are supportive. I know your mom played a role in that, right? Um, or, or was that the middle school? Uh, as, as far as. As far as getting you in, um, I know my my dad mentions that she helped me a lot getting me to Booker T. I mean, she did help me get there, like transport, because we lived far away. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, we lived far away. So, uh, my mom, yeah, she she helped me with the applications um, okay. and driving me there. You know, even though she had a full time job and and um, she dropped everything just so I can go, because for Booker T, I had to have a 15 piece portfolio and I okay. had to go to Booker T and draw in front of them a still life. I wow. had to um, make a sculpture in front of them and I had to do a printmaking uh, wow. thing all in front of teachers. So it was a long process. That's got to be nerve wracking. Oh my God. Yeah. It was very scary. <laughs> you know, it, I think the on, honestly, what's so funny is the hardest one for me was a printmaking and all you had to do is cut pieces of paper I realize I don't have great craftsmanship. Like it's just hard for me to put glue and paper together and make it look well, glue, glue nice. Glue and paper is frustrating. <laughs> it I, don't, is. I don't know if anybody's good at that. Um, uh, yeah, it was tough. But man, you don't really think of. Uh, obviously, tattooing is a little different, but I think kind of the nice thing about art is you know you don't normally have to perform in front of people. You know, you normally get to just make it oh at your house by yourself, so you don't really have people breathing down your neck. I guess. Unless you're in class, sort of thing. Yeah, we're we're all um, <laughs> a lot of us are pretty reclusive. You yeah. know, I again, I I did art because I like just being by myself and and meditating. You know. Yeah. Drawing. Yeah, and that's crazy that that started at at such a young age. But what kind of I mean, what kind of things do you learn when you're, you know, in in art school? But um, even before you know middle school. Well. Um, yeah, before middle school, I, I, I mean, I remember before middle school and elementary school, we had a, a, a practice um, graphite 
mm-hmm. lesson, you know, where you have the sphere and then you have to do um, all the tones of the sphere. It's just, just like drawing a realistic sphere yeah. in pencil or in graphite. Um, so really just learning a little bit about tones. We did a lot of crafts, you know, a lot of building funny stuff, but I really always just like straight up drawing, you know, I don't think I was ever as good as molding like papers together and yeah. paper. And you said you started oil painting in about third grade. Yeah, that was my first class. And I, I remember I took a postcard of like Hawaii, maybe um, and it was a sunset with palm trees you know this classic silhouette and i was so proud of it grandma lily still has it actually (laughs) that's awesome yeah yeah all right well tell me uh tell me about what you studied in in your arts arts high school um so at booker t we're forced to we are forced to try everything so yeah jewelry making printmaking sculpture ceramics photography (laughs) yeah (laughs) the only the only one i didn't try was the metal work because i was terrified of that sounds the torch badass but i guess also (laughs) scary (laughs) yeah (laughs) which you know it's funny because the thing i hurt myself from was actually um carving um tool the exacto knife and sculpting class the first week I had cut myself pretty bad and, and had to go to the nurse. But um, yeah, You should have tried metal working then. <laughs> I know. I <laughs> <laughs> Sounds much safer. Yeah, yeah, probably. Um, yeah, but I what really stuck with me, again, I just always loved drawing and painting. That was, I feel like I'm, I mean, the possibilities are endless with all the things, but especially drawing and painting is just a square canvas and there's yeah. just no limits i think that's what i liked about it so much sure um obviously you know tattooing is a little bit different it's a it's a round canvas it's a it's a literal living canvas you know you're t- tattooing a living organism um but uh d- were you able to learn a lot of things at booker t that you know translate to your your art and your tattooing now yeah yeah um as as far as um I, that's when I took figure drawing as well. So mm. figure drawing really helped me with anatomy. You know, I specialize in portraits uh, and flowers. And when I, when I tattoo, I love doing portraits. So, yeah. you know, I, I learned a bit about anatomy and, and figure drawing and um, edges and tones and stuff. Honestly, though, the, the best part about Booker T was just the practice. You end up doing art. Um, in the beginning a few hours a day but then towards the middle end you go up to like four more hours a day of just yeah. art yeah um so it was really more so the practice i feel like the real um teachings came into play after i was done with school honestly um with, after booker t yeah yeah with um this painting teacher mm. that i learned so much from uh i i still go to um painting classes once a yeah. month now uh, from a 80 year old woman named Miss June, who's amazing. And I, I saw her a little bit years ago when I worked at a different shop and she's just so knowledgeable. She honestly taught me a lot there. Um, the figurative, uh, the figurative arts Academy. I learned a lot from there just a short time. I was there that's in, uh, Fort Worth and, uh, some, some tattooers like Frank, Francisco yeah. Sanchez on Instagram. Um, he taught me a lot of what I know. Yeah. So. But definitely you got a lot from Booker T though, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I definitely did. But the best thing I got from there, I think, was just how much I got to do, how much practice I got in. Too. Yeah. And, and there are normal classes there. You got to take like math and science and English and shit, right? Every other day. Yeah. They okay. had like A day, B day. Gotcha. Okay. So, so you have like could... a day where you only have have art classes and um i have a i have art classes every day but i would have you know math every other day and gotcha writing gotcha. every other day you know gotcha and um i guess there was like art art homework too do you have to do you have oh to go home God. and paint yeah. and stuff <laughs> so much again it's the practice that it's the practice makes perfect no matter how much people tell you or how much advice people tell you it will mean nothing unless you just do it, you know? Yeah. Um, it was the amount of time I put into drawing the homework and everything. I actually got overwhelmed once I remember though. And one of the assignments I did, I did last minute. 
Well, because I, I was going to say, you were a model student, right? <laughs> no. You've always been a great no. pupil. Oh, my Follow God. the rules. Yeah, you know, that's that's sort of the sad part is, is school isn't made for all different types of learning yeah. styles. I was put in the 504 p- program, um, which is people with, like, really bad test anxiety. So I got extra mm. time on tests, extra time on homework. I had to sit in the front of the class because um, I've – I did well, but when it came to tests, I always did terrible since Mm. I can remember, Um, you know, so I was always not great in school Um, and I would get overwhelmed easily, you know, deadlines. I I remember, you know, there was an art project I did the, the night before it was due and I rushed and it was a huge piece of paper um, and it was pastel we had to do and we had to do a self-portrait and I did it really quick and the next day we had to also present all of our pieces and we had to learn how to speak about our art we had to learn Mm. how to critique art we had to Mm, write critiques we had to learn how to speak in front of everybody um so when I presented mine and spoke in front of everybody I said I wanted to portray a sense of anger (laughs) in my piece yeah. and I wanted to pr- portray that through the the strokes that I used because they were just all over the place <laughs> because crazy. you had a rush and it. I ended up getting an 80 on it an yeah. 80 yeah so not yeah. bad well um I, I obviously you know I don't, I don't know how your grades were but um did you did you stand out in in your high school too as far as like um you know being one of the best ones there I know you've been winning art competitions since you were yeah. a kid yeah, so uh, they eventually, towards the end, put us in three separate groups, like um, one, two, and three. Mm-hmm. And they put me in the, I guess, they they called it group one, group two, and group three, but we all knew what they were. And um, we would call them top bananas, like the people who got a lot of hundreds and stuff so uh, there was all the top bananas in group three and that's so i was placed in that group so we got to gotcha we got to do a, a lot more advanced stuff too gotcha yeah gotcha um and so what what do your teachers think of, of you becoming a tattoo artist um well in high school they definitely most of them did not um were, were very against me becoming a tattooer um, especially Miss Tompkins, the head of the department. She, I remember she actually put her hand on my mom's shoulder when my mom told her that I was going to be a tattoo artist, not going to go to art college. And she goes, oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, and, um, yeah, so they, they just weren't a big fan of me. There was one teacher that actually did end up supporting me. Her name was Miss Miller. She hated me the first few years of school, always sent me to detention because of the risque clothes I wore. (laughs) Um, but later on we became very good friends. And, um, even after school ended, she would try to give me assignments of looking up like where tattoos started, you know, um, in history. Oh, that's so cool. I think about her sometimes. Yeah. But, um, for the most part, they, I was the only one who didn't go to an art college. Um, they pushed everybody and they even said they required everyone to do an art like a college course to get ready. Yeah. Um, and I just said, Hey, like, I don't want to, can I opt out of this? And they're like, sure. Yeah. <laughs> yes. You know? Um, and yeah, you know, telling my parents that I wanted to become a tattoo artist too, that. Yeah. I know they've always been supportive, but they didn't, they didn't take that first. super well. Right. Yeah. Not at Yeah. First. What happened? I, uh, well, I, we were in the laundry room and I told my mom, you know, she could tell, she kept t- asking about college and we were, you know, I, I, we wanted me to go to the school of visual arts. And I even had a semester at FIT, you know, um, during the summer just to take some courses. So like, I just wanted to go to New York and go to arts, mm, art yeah, college. Yeah. And, uh, she could tell I was becoming less interested when she was talking about it. And in the laundry room, I said, look, and so this would have been like 16, 17, like your junior year. This was same senior year when oh, okay. everybody was okay. getting ready to go to college. Gotcha. So last minute I was like, I really don't want to go to college. Um, I want to become a tattoo artist instead. You know, I was never good in school. Like I just, yeah. I, it wasn't for me to do more of that. And she cried, you know, <laughs> um, yeah. 
yeah, she she was crying. Back back story, you know, my my mom is Jewish, and you know, and and as liberal as she is you know she's not really religious it's just it's very unheard of you know for everybody and culturally and and all of that for there to be any tattooers yeah you know it goes against the whole religion too yeah but um just a couple weeks later she she decided she was on board and she actually got me my helped me get my first apprenticeship yeah well so when did you you decided i'm guessing before that that you wanted to be a tattoo artist what what made you decide that you wanted to oh, do that? Yeah. So when I was 16 and I was a rebellious teenager, what? I, <laughs> you know, I was, I was, as my mom said in her wedding speech, I was, uh, you know, the opposite of you as a kid. You were, you were so good <laughs> yeah. and I was and, so bad. Yeah. And, and, and by wedding speech, you obviously mean the speech at, at our wedding, not, not your mom's wedding. Right. No. <laughs> right. Um, what was I saying? Oh yeah, how I wanted to become a tattoo yeah. artist. Um, a rebellious teenager. Um, my friend at the time was like, "Hey, I know this guy. He's doing tattoos. He just got out of prison. He's doing it at this guy's place." I was like, "Oh yeah, I want to do it." I was like, "How much would it be?" He's like, uh, "He said forty bucks." I was like, "I only got 30 He said, "That's fine." So <laughs> just. You know, letting you know, just imagine in your head what a thirty dollar tattoo looks like, and I promise that's what it looked like. So, um, and it's mostly covered up now. So I don't yeah. even know. Yeah, yeah, I can kind of see it. Yeah. So I, I was automatically on board, and then I, I just, I was like, wait, what am I gonna get? You know, I know yeah. I wanted something, yeah. but at that time it was very popular for. A, I was a scene kid for sure. For seeing kids to have these little sparrows on their hips mm. so i drew them out and um really poorly <laughs> when i look back on it and then the tattooer tattooed them even more poorly uh they look like penguins sliding down my crotch <laughs> um so i went to this guy's house and like this weird like bottom area of his house which i just call a basement you know it's like this concrete mm. like room like downstairs yeah um and uh yeah i did he, I, did he open the needle in front of you at least <laughs> oh my god <laughs> i i got it i was on the bed i was on a bed and um he just tattooed me on a bed and um i got him done and i realized after seeing them in the mirror i was like man i think i could do better than this guy yeah did you did you think that they were they were poopy or I just thought I was so cool. I just, <laughs> I was the only 16 cred. year old with a tattoo. Yeah. That's because you're not supposed to get tattooed when you're 16. It's, <laughs> For it's valid against the reasons. rules. It's against the law. <laughs> For valid reasons. Yeah. yeah. yeah well, now Don't we know. suggest it to anybody. Yeah. But yeah. So you thought you could do better. Yeah. I just thought I could do better. That's when I just kind of got to switch my brain and became obsessed. And I took it upon myself you know, at that time, there were not good apprenticeships. There was not easy resources. Yeah, well, even that time, that was, I mean, you know, you always say that we're in the renaissance of tattooing, you know, that, you know, the style that you did, it didn't exist. T really, probably too much. When you when you first started, did you have anybody to look up to as far as artists that were doing realism or anything like that? At that point in time, it was Nick Baxter, uh, Nico Hurtado, Paul Booth. Yeah. And Kat Bondi. Yeah. Um. Yeah, and that, that was it. And and how'd you find find about them? Because Instagram wasn't even that big at the time, or wasn't on Instagram. No, um, I only learned about them through my first apprenticeship. So gotcha. I got my first apprenticeship. My mom interviewed a guy, and, uh, mentioned that, oh yeah, I have a daughter who's looking for an apprenticeship, and um, I got a. It wasn't officially an apprenticeship because I was seventeen at the time, but I would just go to the shop you know, as much as I could after high school. So that would have been like, and yeah. So that would have been like the beginning of your senior year. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. So this was before you, you know, proclaimed that your mom was, or to your mom that you were going to be a tattoo artist. Uh, did she not take it seriously or, or, or she thought you were going to go to art college and be a tattoo artist, I guess. 
No, this this was after I, I told her I want to become a tattoo artist. Mm. She was on board, and then she got me this apprenticeship. Gotcha. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, what a what a great mom. Yeah. yeah super supportive. She helped, she yeah. helped hook it up. You know, yeah. she, she was on board and helped me get that. And, um, you know, it, it wasn't, it wasn't a great apprenticeship. <clears throat> yeah. But so all. this was the end of your senior year that you started your apprenticeship. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, started quote unquote, you know, I would go and clean toilets after school and I even helped design tattoos. Yeah. But you, you were know? only 17. Yeah. So it wasn't official. Gotcha. That's why the quote unquote, you know apprenticeship gotcha okay gotcha yeah yeah. i wasn't 18 so it wasn't did you ever have um obviously we know now but it kind of seems like i mean you said it before you know the only way to make money as an artist is if you're dead um yeah it's a sad joke i make yeah it it is i mean it is sad but you know but a, a really good way to make money obviously with with your artist tattooing did that factor into your decision at all yeah you know when i when i looked into this um this career the first thing i thought of was like oh shit this is a cool thing to do yeah um fuck yeah yeah Yeah. and and then when i learned more about it um i realized how much money you can make my original plan was oh you know with my art background maybe i could bring something new to tattooing i can gain notoriety and then i can sell my paintings that was like that was also a goal. Like maybe I'll, I want to just sell custom paintings one day, um, you know, and, and just do, you know, paint whatever I want and sell them. But of course that went away and I became obsessed with tattooing. Um, and during my first apprenticeship, I just really learned, you know, I learned about those tattoo artists. So I would look them up, you know, Nick Baxter and Nico Hurtado. I looked them up on the internet when I got home. Yeah. Um, I would just look at their websites and, and look at their stuff. And that's how I saw tattoos and kind of learned about what you can do. And there was amazing portraits and realism. And Nick Baxter does this really cool, like, I, I don't, I don't even know what you would call it. It's like realism and new school or illustrative Mm. all in one. It was, it was fascinating. And, And when I saw what they could do, I was like, man, I hope like, a goal of mine was like one day I want to be someone that is on their level. Yeah. I, I want to be looked at the way I look at them, you know, and it, it gave me, it just inspired me so much. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll talk more about your first apprenticeship in a second. But, um, you know, one thing that I, I think about when you talk about your, you know, your art background with Booker T, um, arts, middle school, art, uh, art classes in elementary school, even if, all that doesn't translate, you know, directly to tattooing. It always makes me think of, um, you know, Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 hours of excellence theory. Um, if you've ever read that book outliers, um, basically the premise of that theory is that to become an expert or to become a master at something, you've got to spend 10,000 hours of your life doing that thing. Um, and so in that book, it's, it's awesome. Uh, if you haven't read it, it's a really good read, but you know, Malcolm he, uh, Gladwell, he details, you know, specific people who are um, you know, experts or, or have become experts. Um, you know, so it talks about like Bill Gates and and um, hockey players, a, a really wide variety of careers. Um, but the thing that they all have in common is, you know, from a young age, they were able to, you know, start doing what they're now an expert at. And that's kind of what it takes, you know, 10,000 hours, that's an extraordinary amount of time. Um, if you started doing something when you're you're an adult, obviously you've got other responsibilities. So it, it would take you a really long time to get to the point where you're an expert at something. But, you know, with you, Deanna, I mean, starting starting drawing from seven, being put in an art class as art middle school, I mean, doing art all the time. It's like you were talking about a book or tea, um, really just doing it so much. You know, I think that's really helped you um, get to be the artist that you are now, which is which is an expert, you know, in, in, in my opinion. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. It's as, as much as um, I, I guess I've I've done in my career and and everything and the th- things I've accomplished. It's still I definitely have those moments where I don't I I feel like I'm shit. <laughs> so <laughs> well, and I and I um you know I I think that you have a lot of confidence as an artist, which is one thing that I admire about you because it's I think that's difficult. Um, and I think you know you can kind of you or other artists that have achieved a lot, you know, you can step back objectively and kind of see, you know, what you've accomplished and, and maybe that can help reassure you. 
but you know, art is, is inherently imperfect. You know, you're never going to make a tattoo or, or make a painting that's perfect. So as an artist, um, and you know, I used to be a musician, so I I've experienced this too, but you're never going to get to that point where, you know, you're doing everything perfectly. So I think, um, just that, that process of trying to get as close to perfect as you can, um, and never being able to achieve it, you know, that, that makes it difficult. That makes it difficult to say, all right, you know, I'm good. I'm not shit, you know? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I, it's definitely tough. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's a good thing too. Like I, I try to, everything I do, I look at it and say, what, what could I, what could I have done better? Yeah, definitely. You know? So yeah, yeah definitely a good way to stay motivated and keep pushing, especially in an industry where you're, you know, basically at, at the top, you know, there's still your craft, your individual craft and, and getting that as, as great as it can be and as consistent as it can be. Um, so yeah, going back to your, your first apprenticeship, you said it, it said it wasn't the best. You want to elaborate on that a little bit? Ooh, well, yeah, now that I've, I guess it's, <laughs> I've, I've outed the place and the person, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, you know, it, it, it wasn't the best. Um, that was the time where I was working 12 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, and more seven so. Seven days a week. Yeah. Yeah. And, and more so because I would get called. I'd finally finish a day of work. It's, um, two in the morning I'm sleeping and I get woken up to a phone call and I have to pick up one of the artists because he's drunk at a bar and I'd have to get back in my car, pick him up, drive him home happened a few times yeah um, I had to pick up the artists from their place and drive them to work sometimes and drop them back off no one gave me gas money or any money yeah um, to do any of that but yeah it, because I mean obviously apprenticeships are, are not paid right uh, or, I mean I haven't heard of a paid apprenticeship yeah no I it was it's not paid it's an apprenticeship but uh, a tattoo apprenticeship you get basically um you work in exchange for knowledge in exchange for a promise job opportunity, basically. So, yeah. so um, but back in the day when I was apprenticing, it was more hazing as well. Yeah. So kind of for the people, I mean, I, I feel like just anybody outside the industry, they're not, or even clients, you know, they're not super familiar with the apprenticeship model. Um, do you want to kind of talk about like what the general apprenticeship model is? I mean, you kind of mentioned it already, but yeah. what's the premise of like, okay, I got an apprenticeship. What happens now? Well, maybe we should even talk about how to get one. Yeah. Um, so you get an apprenticeship, not by showing tattoos, because that, you know, that's you can a, create that's bad no habits. Yeah. People don't want to see that. I create a portfolio of drawings or line drawings or anything and just present them to shops and just say, hey, are you looking? Here's my portfolio. Um, as far as an apprenticeship goes, once you got it, um, it's... It's basically you, you, again, you work in exchange for learning how to tattoo. So you'll take the trash out, you'll do food errands, you'll clean. Um, that's a good apprenticeship. Um, bad one is where they kind of haze you and make you do ridiculous stuff or put you in danger in any way. Um, which it's how, it's how it was when I was an apprentice. Yeah. It's gotten a lot better these days. Yeah. So, I mean, what, what kind of, did you go through anything specific? Um, yeah, well, besides like my first apprenticeship, I think one of the toughest things about that is I was so overworked. I was crying all the time, yeah. all the time from lack of sleep. I was exhausted. My body hurt. I got sick, you know, um, besides that, it, it was stupid shit, like drinking milk till I threw up or going outside in the summer heat for a few hours a day, you know, with a sign around my neck attached to a string that would cut into my neck, you know, and, and just hold a sign out with like a floaties in my arms and a helmet. So I looked funny and wearing a tube top and short. So it looked like I was naked and, um, dropping it like it was hot. <laughs> they said, you know, they told me to dance sometimes and I didn't have water. Um, the bar underneath the shop would kind of sneak me, you know, come out and give me some water. Yeah. But um, I would just get dizzy and feel like I'm about to pass out. I do it for two hours every day. Um, I had to clean baseboards with toothbrushes and 
go on errands to get things that didn't exist, like a squeegee sharpener or a wood stretcher, and still no gas money, you know, for all of that. So, so those are just a few things. When does to. the when does the learning happen? Um, I it was a privilege to draw during that time to sit mm. and draw and to watch people. Um, I got yelled at when I was watching prematurely from one of the artists. So I didn't get to a lot. Um, you know, it, it wasn't till, you know, a few months in, I guess that I could draw. Draw. Yeah. Wow. Um, and I watched, I think a, a few things, but otherwise I had to be in the front, you know, and I actually had a, the phone taped around my head cause I <laughs> missed it once. Um, ate petroleum jelly. All right. So you were cleaning, answering the phones, running yeah. the desk and kind of just, just everything. You're kind of, kind of the shot bitch, I guess. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and more, you know, and it ended finally because, um, I w was given a piece of sandpaper, the size of my hand. And I was told to sandpaper the steps outside. There's like 30 concrete steps. And I had to sandpaper them because they wanted me to paint them afterwards. But they're like, you got to sandpaper it first. So, you know, hour or two goes in and I'm still on the first step. <laughs> and, yeah. you know, I, it's not done. And I, I get yelled at. I was like, I need a sandblaster or something. They're like, well, then just go home then, you know. And I did. And then I got, woke up to a text message saying, I cannot believe, you know, back to come back. <laughs> And, um, yeah, I was, I was punished for not begging to come back, even though I was told to leave and they would let me know when they wanted me back. And, um, my, you know, I, I was afraid to get my things, but my dad ended up without letting me know, went and got all my artwork back and, wow. and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So that was apprenticeship one. Um, do you think that's pretty characteristic of, of the kind of apprenticeship that most people went through yeah yeah and there's still some these days where you know sure. apprenticeships are really hard so you gotta you know if you're someone who's looking to find an apprenticeship just watch out i used to the five years i was apprenticing um i told myself well if i want it bad enough i gotta do this i just gotta push through it don't think that you have to go through terrible things to be become a tattooer that's an advice I would give now is that if you feel uncomfortable at any point in time you should go to a different shop yeah yeah and 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 I really feel for you and other people that are in that situation where they feel like they have to go through something abusive because you know becoming a tattoo artist and, and having an apprenticeship is hard I mean you obviously had it hard, but, um, you know, you had the added bonus of having your, your family be supportive. You know, you were able to live at home. You know, a lot of these, um, apprentices that are trying to become two artists, you know, they're tattoo artists, they're, they're working a second job. So, you know, on top of, you know, their shop duties, they're, they're, they got to go home and, and make money. So it's, it's insanely difficult. And it is really sad that, you know, people feel like, you know, th they've got to go through abusive stuff. And to be honest, there are a lot of people out there that want to be tattooers and they're, you know, apprenticeships are, are very limited. So I, I do feel for people that, um, yeah. feel like, you know, they have to go through something abusive. Um, obviously I second that you should not do that, but, uh, it's for anybody who doesn't know. Yeah. Be becoming a tattoo artist is, is really, really difficult. Right. You know, it's cause it's, it's not really regulated, you know, to become one, especially in Texas, you don't have to log hours. You have to do any of that. Um, so yeah, it's sort of just based on tradition. Yeah. Yeah. And that's another good point is that, you know, in other States there's an apprenticeship license or there's a tattoo license. Um, but in Texas it is very unregulated. Um, pretty much the only thing you need to tattoo is, is, you know, the studio that you're tattooing at. Um, you need to have, have a, um, a certificate from the health department, you know, license you can do it to tattoo. Um, but because of that, you know, sometimes, there's, there's not a set amount of time for, for an apprenticeship or anything like that. So sometimes it can, it can drag on, right. you know, as in, as in your case. Right. Well, it, it, you know, typically they're about two years. Um, with me, I just kept getting pushed away from different apprenticeships. So yeah, I keep so, starting over. So you, you quit the first one or got, got fired. fired. However you want to look yeah. at it. Got fired. 
Um, I was also told that I couldn't work anywhere in the city, um, that he would spread, you know, my name around and I wouldn't find a job here. So I looked to New York and I knew my grandparents lived up there. I knew I could live with them and see what was around there. So I looked for a shop that um, had good reviews and I flew up, interviewed, flew back, got the job and then moved all my stuff there soon after. There was just, how did I think about it? There were so many times where I could have quit or maybe should have and I, I don't know. I just wanted, I wanted this so badly and starting over was painful. Yeah. Doing it over and over again, but I mean, obviously it was worth it. Yeah. It still pains me to think how much time I feel like I wasted. Yeah. Well, of course it, it paid off, but yeah, moving to a new state, that's, it's really starting over from, from square one. Yeah. So I it, left my, you know, four year relationship and, um, family. Well, I had my grandparents and, yeah. but you know, no, no friends. I, I lived in their basement. Um, and I worked at a shop there and that was tough in itself. The shop, was it, was the shop in the city or was it on Long Island? Island? Okay. Yeah. Um, the, the hours weren't as bad as the first apprenticeship. I got to have, a, I believe two days off. Wow. What a concept. Yeah. So, um, still had it clean. Um, didn't have to do too much stupid shit really. Yeah. So that was, that was nice. It was, it was the people there that were bad. Um, I mean, the, the people weren't great at all in the first apprenticeship i i was definitely you know verbally abused but this one was was a lot more this was this hit a lot deeper um not only was i a, by myself and i didn't really have friends there i was in a vulnerable position and um became close to whoever i could grasp and fortunately they were dangerous you know, people in that, in that shop, especially one. So, um, yeah, so I just got pushed off to mentor to mentor until I, I was with this guy and, um, uh, you don't have to share if you don't want to. Yeah. No. Yeah. yeah it's, well, can you talk about why, why I, you left? I, yeah, I, yeah. I, I could talk, I could talk about it. Um, yeah, sorry. He was just, it, I knew he was dangerous when he started like buying like illegal guns in the back of the shop and, and, and pretending to be the boss and calling me to fire me and, and stuff. And, um, you know, other things I, I, it got bad to a point where I felt unsafe and I mentioned that hey you know to the owner like hey like I don't feel I don't feel safe being under the sky you know can I work with somebody else and they're like if you can't work with him you can't work with anyone just go back to Texas so that's how I actually got um fired from that shop but two months later exactly that guy I was I felt dangerous I felt was dangerous ended up shooting and killing his wife in the head in front of his three and four year old kids and is now in prison the rest of his life. So I guess you would say I dodged a bullet. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, thank you for sharing that. I mean, obviously that's hugely traumatic. You know, nobody should ever have to go through anything like that. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, yeah. Yeah. It was, and, and I think it's good to share, you know, anyway, just kind of my whole story, you know, good and bad. Uh, just so people know and can also be aware and you know know what to look out for yeah well that was apprenticeship number two yeah. i'm gonna go on to number three <laughs> so i fly back home and um you know i lost again don't know what to do my mom helped me get my other my third apprenticeship um, she was interviewing a guy named mark merchant because she was um doing it interview my mom works for the media by the way she was doing a video yeah so when you said interviewing that first person that helped you get the job at ae like literally interviewing them for like a like a story not yeah like a, job, like, right? a yeah. like a news yeah. story yeah. yeah my my mom was in news 
So uh, she interviewed this guy named Mark Merchant because she was doing a story of Kalachanjis, and he was there all the time, and he had all these tattoos, you know. Um, and she was like, you know, my daughter just, you know, she came back from New York. She's looking for another apprenticeship, and uh, he decided to interview me and take me on as an apprentice, um, which he he was he was fine, you know, and. Uh, he had me draw a lot of traditional. That's where I learned um, a lot of traditional stuff. His stuff yeah, so is that, very bold. So I'll stop you right there. That's the first time I've heard you talk about learning something in an apprenticeship. <laughs> Did you learn stuff in New York? Uh, they 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 didn't teach me anything. They just said, hey, you're going to tattoo for two days in a row. Free tattoos. People lined up the door, and I fucked up about 20 people. Good Lord. So that is that when you did your first legal Tattoo or, you know, legal. Yeah. Like your first tattoos in a shop. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, so we got. They were, they were terrible. I mean, I did not know how to hold a machine yeah. or anything. Yeah. They just threw me, threw me in. Yeah. So, all right. So two days of tattooing, that's some pretty good, that's a pretty good learning experience right there. You're pretty yeah. much a pro at this point. And, and, you know, so going back, you're back in Texas and you're learning how to draw traditional tattoos right yeah so he had me t- uh, buy sailor jerry books and i had to pick designs and i had to trace a design over and over and over again on tracing paper with a micron because that's traditionally how we used to do tattoo Back stencils before ipads um and so i learned a lot about that and he i i was also told that he was gonna give me like a hundred hours of work of tattooing because I needed to watch him. So I was about to have a full body suit basically of this stuff. Oh, he was going to tattoo you yeah. for a hundred hours. Jeez. Yeah. <laughs> he told me that was part of the apprenticeship. He had to give me like an insane amount of hours of tattoo work, but that's a lot. Yeah. So for reference, um, I'm a tattoo collector myself. I've got about 270 hours of work on me and, and you know, I've got Full back piece, two full sleeves, most of my leg, you know, my chest. So that's that's a lot of tattooing right there, 100 hours. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, sadly... Uh, well, especially if he's doing traditional because <laughs> that stuff goes by a lot quicker oh than God, yeah. realism. And, and he does big. He doesn't use... he At that point, he didn't use anything smaller than a 14-round liner. Yeah. Um, And very simple, very bold, very big. Um, Very solid work. He's a, you know, super solid tattooer. Yeah. Sadly, his, his mom was sick, so he had to leave. So he kind of left me at the shop I was at. So he, he I, had to leave for his his mom was sick in a different, you know, in San Antonio. So he mm, had to okay, leave. Okay, okay. So he kind of yeah, he put left me, Dallas. Yeah, put me into the arms of whoever wanted me at, in that shop, and that's when I was picked up by Joby, Joby Cummings. And um, I think out of all the apprenticeships, that was the best one that I had. Yeah. Um, was with Joby. He he taught me more, and I say that because he taught me more than than any of the other guys did. Yeah. Um, I drew a lot. I watched him all the time. I watched him every day to the point where I was falling asleep, and he would make me go outside and take a walk and yeah. come back. Um. But yeah, I was still doing an insane amount of cleaning. Um, I felt like an insane amount, an insane amount more than the other guy apprentices that was there with me um, an insane amount more of a uh, responsibility yeah yeah so there was like two studios um i had to clean both of them i had to scrub like around 100 tubes a day back then there was no disposable tubes there was yeah, stainless tubes yeah what's a, what's a tube because a lot of people don't know a tube is a grip um that you hold when you tattoo so like uh you put the needle through it and okay yeah yeah so you had these tiny little like scrubbers that scrubbed inside the little tube and then you had to get the tip that had ridges and if there was like a tiny bit of ink you get your ass yeah. chewed out. And now it's and now it's all disposable. Now it's all disposable which scrubbing tubes was the worst part of the of the cleaning. Yeah. You know, it would take most of the day to do. Um because you had to scrub each one, you had to put them in the ultrasonic you had to log everything down. You had to open the packages, package them, label the packages, put them in the autoclave, usually multiple runs at a time. And then the autoclave was so old that if I left it uncared for, um, it would. I was told it would explode. So I had to sit in a chair for around three hours it would take. 
sitting there in front of the autoclave, watching the lever, make sure it didn't go in the red, um, and releasing the pressure anytime it did. And yeah, and then distributing them afterwards. It was a pain in the ass. Yeah. Um, but I was doing a lot of a lot of work, and for a long period of time, I it was I was there for like three years. Um, wow. Which is just a long, long time. And and and, and remember, you know, you said apprenticeships t- traditionally take two years. Right. Yeah. Right. Um. So at at that point, I was I was tattooing maybe like a couple months. And I was still being yelled at to change toilet paper and still cleaning both shops. All the other guys were just chilling. And I eventually finally asked, like, there was a point where I was like, you know, I think I'm just going to be an apprentice forever. I didn't even, the grasp that I, the were, concept that I had that I would become a tattooer someday was gone. Yeah. And were you tattooing at this point at all? Yeah. For a few months. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, at this point I, I really thought my apprenticeship was going to last forever. So when you say, say, I mean, obviously you were tattooing, but when you say you were still an apprentice, you know, you were still doing apprenticeship duties, you know, cleaning shit that, that, you know, graduates Mopping. of the apprenticeship program, they don't, they don't have to do that. You know? Right. Yeah. And, and I say that graduates very loosely, you know, there's no, like I said, there's no apprenticeship program, but you know, when you say that you thought you'd never become a tattoo artist, that's what, you know, that's what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. It just, I, I was an apprentice for so long and I felt like it was never going to end and, um, that I was just going to clean and, and just be the shop bitch forever. Um, and finally I, I asked, you know, I was like, why are, why am I not moving forward? Like these guys are, um, these other apprentices and why am I doing more work and tattooing just like they are? Um, and so she went and asked the owner because they were, you know, practically married. She came back and told me, and she's like, he just says girls get treat, treated than, differently than guys in this industry. I don't know what to tell you. And that was the first time that I chose to end my apprenticeship on my own terms. Um, I left. I didn't, I wasn't fired. I, I quit that apprenticeship. I called up my, um, you know, Frank and Remember, who just started Dark Age, who are these amazing tattooers that I looked up to. And they tattooed at that shop, right? Yeah, I yeah. knew them because they tattooed at that shop. And they, they had recently left to open the studio. And I was like, look, I'm a, I just said, I'm a full-time tattooer. Can I work with you guys? And, you know, they later told me they knew that I was tactically an apprentice still yeah. by, by um, the other shop standards. But they let me work there. And that's when my my work jumped significantly when I worked there and started getting advice from, from Frank and Remember. Yeah. So that's – and obviously that's when you got kind of the bulk of your your tattoo education. Yeah. Yeah. Because even like in the, the last apprenticeship I had, I was never watched. Nobody ever watched me tattoo. I still didn't really know what I was doing. Um, you know, and still, of course – cleaning most of the time so I didn't have much time um and making like no money or any of that so when I went to dark age it changed my life you know I was making money I I was tattooing how I wanted and Frank and Remember saw the top or like what I had to give and helped me cultivate a style they knew that I was good at portraits and realism so they pushed me to do my first portrait and then was like we're gonna give you all of the portrait inquiries from now on and they they taught me how to do realism and that's what I was meant to do you know yeah yeah so that's my long story (laughs) yeah the the five-year apprenticeship yeah yeah well and that's a gnarly story and and you know I know you've kind of mentioned it here and there maybe on Instagram or what have you but you know you know, very rarely do you have the opportunity to kind of sit down and tell everybody all of that. So I, and, and obviously, you know, there's so much that you left out, you know, things that you've told me that, you know, you you can't, you can't share with people honestly, Mm -hmm. or that, you know, you could, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't blame you for not feeling comfortable. So, um, yeah, definitely a crazy amount to go through to, you know, just to be able to say that you're a a tattoo artist. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. It, It, it made me appreciate where I am today and, 
all the hard work that I went through just to get here and appreciate all the people who really helped me get to where I am. I'm forever grateful. Um, but yeah, I'm just thankful to be here. Yeah. And um, I'm sure that that experience has also, you know, molded the way you go about your apprenticeship program, you know, yeah. that you teach and host. And we'll get that, get to that in a little bit. Um, but I want to go back to, you know, to dark age, you know, where you started learning. Um, so when you first started tattooing, um, is, did you start off doing realism? I know you said you studied a lot of traditional tattoos and stuff like that. Tell me about your style when you, when you first got to dark age. So when I first got to dark age, I just knew traditional work, you know, cause that's what I was told to do at, um, at the last shop. Cause no one really did what I wanted to do. No yeah. one was at that level either yeah. to show me. Um, and dur you know, with the realism and, um, so yeah, so I was doing trad and, yeah. uh, which is crazy. I, I was not, I wasn't very good, you know? Um, and still I was just passionate about faces and stuff. Yeah. So. Yeah. So tell me about like when you did your first portrait. Uh, so I did my portrait. It was of Salvador Dali. Um, it was my first color portrait and, um, it's the first time I got to pick all the colors. Um, remember helped me with colors and picking them out, tell me what colors to mix. Frank helped me with technique. Um, you know, what needles to use and how to brush the, the ink in basically to where I blended things out. And it took me all, I, I had to come in and, and tattoo portfolio pieces for free on my days off. Yeah. So I would come in on my day off. So say, this was on a day off yeah, for it was, free. It was for free just so I could do whatever I wanted to do. There was no pressure. I get tattooed for a long time. Um, yeah. So I just spent all day and I got halfway done with the face. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Took me all day. But that's when uh, I, I remember Frank and remember being like, oh shit. <laughs> like, yeah. Awesome. Cool. Yeah. Cool. 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 <laughs> And, <laughs> and, um, yeah, when I finished it, they, that's, yeah, they were like, okay, well, we're, we're going to give you these inquiries from now on. And, um, that's when I dove into color portraits and that was yeah. my specialty at that time was color portraits, color in general, um, color. I did my first color rose around that time too. And it just opened a whole door cause I saw what I was meant to be tattooing. Yeah. And obviously, you know, your, your clients, you know, your potential clients saw that too. And, 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 you know, they asked for that. So just, just when any, but any tattoo artist is building that, that portfolio or their portfolio, that kind of becomes like a, a snowball effect. You know, you got to do some, some of whatever you want to do. So, you know, so people ask for it. Um, you know, we just, we talked about earlier about being able to practice. That's kind of, that's kind of how you get good at that stuff is you just get to tattoo it a lot. Yeah, absolutely. Come on days off, tattoo people for, for free. So you have the freedom to do whatever. Um, it all getting good just takes a lot of work and a lot of practice. Yeah. Um, There's no shortcuts. Yeah. All right. So we're at dark age. Um, tell me about how you got on ink master. Ooh, that's a whole story now. Go on. <laughs> Um, not as long as a story as my apprenticeship, but, um, well, granted that's like three stories and, and one. Or right. More. Right. Um, for ink master, I, I applied, um, I applied to be on the ninth season, I believe it was like shop wars. Yeah. And do, and do you know how long you were at dark age at this point? Um, maybe like three years. Maybe? Okay. So a while. So you maybe, yeah. I think so. Yeah, because Ink Master was what, 2017? Yeah. Like late, early 2017. Yeah, so I was there for like three years. Dang. Because I started around 2014. Dang, so Ink Master was five years ago. 16. Jesus, yeah. <sighs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, um, so yeah, so you applied. Yeah, so I, I applied and um, I didn't get it, but not too long afterwards, I was hit up to do Ink Master Angels. It was like a spinoff show of Ink Master where yeah. Ryan Ashley, Nikki Simpson, Kelly Doty, Gia Rose, um, they went to different cities around the U.S. and competed against people, and they were they wanted me on that show. So I got to compete, um, go through three different rounds to compete with two other people in Dallas, 
made it to the last round, had to compete against one of the angels. I competed against Gia. Um, it was so stressful, you know, being on a reality show for the first time. It was like a four yeah. day thing. Um, very exhausting, very, uh, it, it, was, it was scary. Um, but I ended up winning. I ended up winning all of it. Yeah. So crazy enough. Yeah. And, and the deal was like you winning Master Angels, like you get a spot on, on season 10 of Ink Master, right? Right. That, yeah. that was the deal. So that's how I got my spot on Ink Master was I won uh, my, my episode of Ink Angels. Yeah. Did you get a lot of exposure from Ink Master Angels, you think? Um, I, I did. Yeah, because when the episode air, I aired, I was filming Ink Master, and I looked at my Instagram and Facebook, and it was just shooting up. Yeah, I bet. Thousands and thousands of followers. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was the f- first time I got this crazy high from seeing my followers go up. I was at 15K when I started before anything and then i was close to around like 50 60 after the episode started um and i don't know like it it sucks how much of my self-worth sometimes i put into my instagram followers but it, it definitely it made me feel good it made me feel like wow like people are seeing my stuff and are liking my work and like yeah I've been passionate about this for so long, so it was just good to feel recognized. Yeah, especially when you spent so much time working. You know, you, yeah. you literally had moments where you thought, okay, I'm never going to become a tattoo artist. So, yeah, of course, you know, that would be gratifying getting to the point where, you know, you, you, you're successful, there are eyes on your work, you know, and you're, you're getting recognized for what you're doing. So, yeah, I don't, I don't blame you at all for <laughs> definitely getting a high from that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but, yeah, then I was on Ink Master, and... That was, oh my God, that was the most rewarding and stressful time of my life. Yeah. Um, so t- so tell, tell us a little bit about um, like the, the filming, the show process. Yeah. So um, it was all done in Newark, New Jersey, which I originally thought it was in New York until I was in the airport and looked at my ticket. I was like, that's a funny way to spell New York. I've never even heard of <laughs> Newark. Yeah. And then I realized yeah. I was going to a whole different state. Um, oh, you're like, what the fuck? Yeah, it's yeah. Bullshit. It's bullshit. <laughs> so Newark, New Jersey, nothing crazy there. Um, and we were filming and living was all done in one building. So we were packed like sardines. Um, there was 25 people starting off yeah. in the show. Um, and we all met each other, you know, at, at this hotel first. I got to see who was on the show. I saw Josh Payne who I looked up to for years. And I was like, oh, shit, well, now I know I'm going to lose. <laughs> that was <laughs> immediate. I was like, oh, okay, well, I'm, I'm done. Um, I know who's going to win. He yeah, did end up alert. Yeah. winning. Yeah, yeah. he did. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and then we met each other, and then we got our bags. That actually, when we were in the hotel, the first few days we were there, we had to put all our phones in a box, and that box got stolen. So oh my. everybody and Tessa. Oh yeah, I forgot about Tessa. you telling me that. Yeah. Tessa was in charge of everyone's phones and all of that. And, and Tessa's the the producer. Yeah, one, or one, one of the of producers. The, yeah. And oh my god. Yeah, that box got stolen and everybody's phones got stolen. What a way to start out. Well, yeah, it was yeah, that sucked. But during filming, you know, they had they took each of us to the Apple store and got new phones. Yeah. But yeah, we met each other, did our first uh, our first round uh, to see like who would make it on the show, and that was at Coney Island. Yeah, we got to see the judges and Dave Navarro for the first time, and um, tattoo, and, and and yeah, remind me again what what tattoo did you start out with there? So this was the first time I actually shaded a face with a liner and, and discovered my stippling technique <laughs> was the first thing I did on Ink Master. Bold. Yeah, very bold. Did you do that on purpose? I, I don't remember how it happened. I just kind of started with a liner and I kept going. I was like, wait, I think this You're looks like, this cool. Looks and I just kept going with it. Yeah. Damn. Okay. I, yeah. I didn't know that actually. Yeah. yeah. And it sucked because my iPad died. When, when time started oh and, lord and so i had to like turn it back on but it would die every time i used procreate it was stressful finally got it 
So it died like while you were trying to design. Yeah. Oh shit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's important. Yeah. So I, but I, I managed to get the the stencil, the design, and everything printed out, stencil it, um, and it was of a lady face because I knew it. the The challenge was we could do whatever we wanted. Yeah. So I got it. I wanted to show off. I wanted to do a face. I wanted to do line work because Ink Master loves lines. What? Yeah, and uh, <laughs> they like bold lines, bold shading, coloring. So I wanted to do just a cool mixture, and I ended up getting top three, you know? Um, and that was the best I did ever <laughs> on Ink Master. It kind of was downhill from No, there. you definitely – you won, like, best of day a couple times, right? Never. No, really? I was, I was the only Ink Master in time to go as far as I did – and be at the bottom as much as I did. Yeah, I remember your your first challenge was at the at the bottom, right? Like the first challenge. My you guys first did? challenge after the well, technically my or, second. Uh, yeah, I guess the second. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I was at after the bottom. After you made it on the show, because mm-hmm. so, my maze wasn't big enough. We had to incorporate a maze, and it wasn't big enough. Yeah, so. that was a badass tattoo, though. I remember Thank seeing you. that on I Instagram, so and too. I saw. I remember seeing it on Instagram, and then I went back and watched the show, and I was I was like. Damn, she did not deserve to be in the bottom. And this is before we knew each other, obviously. But um, thank you. But okay, yeah. So you had your first competition. You made it on the show, and then you the um, got to pick your mentor. Yeah. Whom you looked up to greatly, right? <laughs> oh well, I. Yeah. <laughs> so we had, there was that the season was about um, three past ink masters had to compete against each other and also have a team. Um. And so I, I never, honestly, never watched Ink Master. So I didn't know who these three <laughs> tattooers were. Um, so I was, I got third, you know, third place. So I was a third person to pick which team I wanted to be on. And I picked DJ because that was the only name I heard because the first two picked him. <laughs> so I picked him. Ended up being the best decision. DJ is now, I, I think, one of, one of the best tattooers yeah, in the world. Yeah, he's awesome. Oh my God. And, um, yeah, it was a great team to be on. Met Frank Reddy. He's like my favorite, favorite person on the show. But yeah. And so we, we did that also the, we weren't allowed outside. So that was another thing that was hard on Ink Master. Well, we were allowed outside just like on the balcony, you know, and, and we could have, (laughs) but, but you couldn't leave. Right. We couldn't leave. Um, if we did, it was escorted, you know, so we go for a little bit to the gym. You know, we I, I did that once, came back. Um, I definitely got cabin fever around day 22. Yeah, because it was like, what, like three months? Well, I'm, and especially because you made it so far. Yeah, so I made it towards the end. The guy who won and everything, everybody who went on past me were was only there a day longer than me so mm, i was yeah. there the whole time yeah. the whole it was two months yeah two months packed like sardines you know sharing one the guys had one bathroom and then there was another bathroom oh, good lord so sharing the showers um and just but the cool thing is we could you know dj and josh cooked a lot like we could get any food we wanted from the grocery store we just put it on a list we were like drinking till three in the morning. I was I started teaching people painting. I I was teaching Josh and Anthony and yeah people how to oil paint. Um, so that was fun to do, and it was like an art party, but it was also extremely stressful, especially um. Well, yeah, especially when you're competing. Yeah, I was competing or during filming. You know. Yeah, and and at that time, it was a really, really, really rough year for me when I started Ink Master. And a, another reason I wanted to start Ink Master is because I. I, I guess I would say I got sick um, and there was a whole year long story and I don't want to get into I I got these unknown ailments I didn't know what they were I didn't know if I was dying or not so another reason I wanted to go on Ink Master is just to see if I can get my name out there one last time um, and I just wanted to like push myself to do things you know and so I, I was going through all these ailments um, so that was also scary. And so during the Ink Master, the stress made everything worse. So I got sick a lot. I was on antibiotics multiple times. Um, and 
one night I swallowed an antibiotic without enough water and I burnt an ulcer in my throat and had to get an endoscopy oh. while I was on the show. So they had to like switch filming around for me. I had to be driven to the city, be put under anesthesia, ah. go in a hospital and like all of this happening, happening while I'm by myself in filming. So I, I actually wanted to quit after that, but the producer was like, you shouldn't, you know? Yeah. So it was, yeah, it was so stressful and hard on my body, um, but so worth it. And the thing that knocked me off the show, unfortunately, was Portrait Day. I got top five, spoiler alert. So I made it towards the end. Um, it was Portrait Day. I thought I nailed it. Well, and we all thought you nailed it, too. Well, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I just got a really bad. Uh, it was a hard reference because I chose. I was, I was told I should choose the reference. That was the smallest one. It was like a picture the size of. Who told you that? <laughs> Josh. Thanks, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> well, because he said he's seen a different episode, and he was like, "Oh, I saw someone pick the." this really tiny image like wedding photo that was vintage and when they blew it up it was like the best reference i bet yours will be mm. that so i was like okay i trust you and i even said out loud to the whole production tr crew i was like if i blow this wedding photo up this the photo the face was probably the size of like a skittle <laughs> um if what i blow what this about up an <laughs> or an <laughs> no <laughs> If I blow this image up, does everyone have a good scanner and printer to where it's not going to be blurry? And everyone's like, yeah, we got it. So I'm like, cool, I'm going to pick the riskiest one. And everybody gasped. And it really made for a good episode because everyone's like, why the fuck did Deanna pick the worst reference photo out yeah. of all of them? And I thought it was just going to be a winner. Yeah. I'm glad I did because I think for as much as I specialize in portraits, if that were to go to anyone else, I feel like it may be might have not have been as good. So yeah. I'm glad I at least Well and, got and, it. and by that you mean obviously like people forget, you know, these are real tattoos going on real people. Mm -hmm. And clearly that one was a family photo, you know, good thing that girl she's got she's got a good tattoo, honestly. Yeah. So if any if it, anybody else would have got it, it would have been probably fucked up and and so at least she got a good tattoo yeah. out of it. And it it was tough and I was told I had the best technique and the best application. Um but it was just a it was just and I, and I do remember watching that episode and watching you get eliminated and, and, you know, this was before we knew each other again, but I remember thinking that, you know, you did not deserve to go home. Thank you. And did you feel like you did or? Well, at that point in time, I really wanted to go home. Um, cause that day I actually got a 24 hour virus mm. and I was projectile vomiting every 30 oh minutes my God. and I had a fever. So not only was I puking everything, um, well, because of that, when we're supposed to be in the house, like fighting each other, talking about who did better, they put a, they put one of the producers in my place while I was in the bathroom throwing up. So like people could pretend to yell at me, you know, yeah. but I couldn't be there for it because I was so sick. I was shivering and I actually, they let me stay a couple days after I got eliminated because, you know, they were afraid of me going off and being as sick as I yeah. was. So yeah. Yeah, so let's talk about that some more. I mean, not, not the sickness, but, you know, the fact that Ink Master is a reality TV show. Um, how much of that is fabricated? Um, so not not too much. Like, none of us would have fought each other, honestly. Yeah. That's the thing. Well, and, and you mentioned before, you know, you guys were all living in the house. So I'm, I'm assuming you guys were all friends pretty much. Yeah, yeah we were point, all especially. friends. We didn't want to fight, but they would tell us it's not friend master, yeah. you know, which made sense. Like if you wanted to see tattooers get along, go to a convention. This is a reality TV show. We're fighting to get a hundred thousand um, dollars and the title of ink master. And we had to fight each other for it. Yeah. Um, I, I was the only one that really didn't confront people though. Yeah. I don't have that in me. Um, I was told I wouldn't be on the show as much, you know, and I probably should, but I just didn't have it in me to confront people and which ended up being a good thing. Cause I think being my real self on the show, people gravitated towards that. Yeah. Um, yeah, totally. And, uh, yeah, for everybody who doesn't know Deanna in person, um, obviously I'm a little bit biased cause I'm her husband, but 
um, even when I met her, you know, I was really surprised at, you know, how, how down to earth and, and honestly, like she's a lot in, in person. Um, she's really similar in person to the way she was on the show. So, you know, I think she got portrayed in a, in a pretty accurate light, honestly. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. I got um, you out of it. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, among other things. Um, but yeah, so speaking of what you got out of Ink Master, um, you know, obviously you're following grew a ton from the show yeah um so yeah my after the show was done my following just shot up i gained that notoriety that i wanted um and it, it, it was great you know i at that point i think i was at the top of my social game social media game yeah and i was posting all the time and people were interested and and what I had to do. And I, I felt like I, I could then guest spot wherever I wanted and travel. And, and it, it was just, yeah, that, that was, that was the time. Yeah. That was the time right there. I, I, I felt like part of the tattoo community I wanted to be in. Yeah. Um, so o- almost off the topic of Ink Master, but, um, Obviously, they place a lot of importance on, you know, kind of kind of line work and, and old school tattoo stuff. And even though you made it really far, you know, you spent a lot of time at the bottom. Um, do you think that's fair or, or how, how do you value kind of the work that you were doing on Ink Master? I never did a piece that I was like I did my I could do my best on. You had to do a tattoo and a f- six hours, but they said do a four hour tattoo in a six hour period because they don't look at the piece itself they zoom in and look at the line work and the shading and the technical side so as long as the technical stuff was good you were good you know and i'm a lot more loose and artistic and painterly and light and soft you know the opposite of what the 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 judges wanted so yeah, they weren't a fan of my stuff, and I couldn't do a lot of the stuff I really wanted to do. Yeah, you know they talk a lot about you know tattoos that last, and it's kind of it's really it's kind of an old school mentality of you know the magic black outline and do you, yeah. Can you speak to that at all? Yeah, you know, like Ink Master, there was great things and not so great things that come out of that. Um, it teaches people how to look for good line work and look for solid application looking for a tattoo artist but also it teaches people that there's only one way a tattoo can be good and that's if it's bold yeah and has a black outline yeah um there is such thing as soft tattoos they all fade over time some a little bit more than others you know but they all age and they all soften. And just because one tattoo is soft or doesn't have this outline around it does not mean that it's not as good as the other as long. I mean, you could just tell with your eyes what looks cool. Yeah. What makes a good tattoo. And I, and I think that's super important for, you know, both artists and clients to know, you know, obviously a tattoo is going to fade over time. Um, but you know, there's, there's honestly, there's not really such thing as like a magic black outline that's going to hold, hold your tattoo in. Um, Right. It's It's just like, you need contrast. So not necessarily a black outline, but if you have a black color shading part, you know, or, or deep colors with light, like you can't just put pinks and whites and yellows in one area and say, okay, you know, this is good. Like you got to have contrast. So as long as you are knowledgeable you know, with how to apply a tattoo and get the contrast right and all of that doesn't mean it needs a black outline around yeah. it. Yeah. And I think that's the biggest thing is just, um, it's not, it's not really about, you know, the style of the tattoo. It's about the application. And obviously from an expert artist, knowing how that tattoo is going to heal over time and, and change over time and taking that into consideration when, how to apply the tattoo. Right. And I, I like the way my tattoos soften. I like how soft they are. I like how there's some parts you can see through them. I think some of them look better when they're healed. I mean, the, you know, the piece Thank on my you. thigh, I think that looks, it almost looks better than, than three years ago when you did it. Thank you. you. Know? Yeah. yeah. And it's subjective. You know, we're told this one thing forever that bold will hold and that's, that means it's good, you know, and 
it's hard to kind of open your mind to other things too. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, that's Ink Master. Any, anything you want to add about that? Um, if you're a tattooer that's thinking about going on it, I say go for it. You know, there's, you'll definitely get some hate from some tattooers. Um, but you shouldn't care what anyone thinks. You should do what's best for you, best for your career. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. So tell me about Ink Master. I mean, you said a little bit ago that you felt like you could guest spot anywhere you wanted to. Did you do that? Yeah, I guest spotted everywhere. I made friends. Um, I went to multiple conventions. That's where I I won a lot of my awards. I traveled the country um, and I gained that notoriety to where I I could go wherever and I can learn and work with artists I looked up to. It, It was a goal that I had set out for myself. I finally reached it. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess kind of around that time is, is when you left dark age. Um, you know, you learned so much, you got so much out of dark age. Can you, can you talk about, you know, why you felt like it was time for you to leave? Yeah. So I just, I was like, I was ready to leave the nest, you know? Um, I wanted to move out of Denton because it's a smaller town. I wanted to go to Dallas and, and start in the city and, you know, get a good apartment and go to a private studio because at that point I could go to one now. I didn't need the walk-ins and, and all of that. Um, I felt like I, I learned and got to the point in my career to where I could do that. So I left the nest, basically. Yeah. Yeah, and do you feel like that was a good move for you? Yeah, and I, I still miss, you know, I still miss it sometimes, like being at Dark Age and having people would be like, hey, like, can you look at my tattoo and, and tell me what I need to do? And, yeah. and just have that advice right there and, and um, you know, the friends that I made there. But um, it, it was the right move, you know? Yeah. Then I started my own thing, and, you know, I met you, and you helped my career, you know, significantly as well. You know, you, you, you had the whole business mindset, so when we met and we got together, you saw what I could do better business-wise and helped me get the prices where they needed to be, helped with emails, and now we have a studio together. Yeah. So. Yeah, and just to back up a little bit, I mean, I feel like, you know, you said you missed – having other people around that you could ask like, Hey, you know, how can I make my tattoo better? And I think that's one thing that is really difficult when these artists go to open up their own studios is you, Mm -hmm. you go from not being the best one there to being the best one there, or, or, you know, particularly like the the studio that you went to, um, you know, it, everybody there did different styles. So it wasn't even a matter of being the best, but you didn't really have, you know, other people around that you could, it, it, cause I do like now I'm at a shop, honestly, the place that we're at, everybody's amazing. It's just, nobody does it, the style that I do, Yeah, you know? Um, so that, that's the thing I liked asking is, is people who did soft realism or soft black and gray, you know, asking them and, and stuff. But man, the cool thing is, is that we work with so, so much talent and they all do everything different and really fucking well. So it's nice being around other types of tattoos too. Yeah, for sure. Um, so yeah, after you switch to that private studio, that's, I feel like your traveling was slowing down a little bit there, but that's also kind of the time that you got into seminars uh, and hosting seminars. Yeah. Yeah. So now that I sort of kind of reached that initial goal that I set out for myself, um, I like the idea of teaching. So, you know, with the shop that we have together, I, I, I'm doing seminars now and now we host them. I, I like my teaching yeah. my apprentices. And but also you started doing seminars, you know, at the private studio, even before we opened Eden. Yeah. Yeah. What, what made you want to do that? Um, what, just finding the next thing. Yeah. You know, I, I just, the <laughs> When I was in first grade, I, I wanted to be a teacher. That was the, the what I had in mind before. You know, yeah, I was doing art, but I didn't think of being an artist. I wanted to be a teacher. So um, that's just something I always had in me. I like teaching people tattoos and talking about tattoos. And I feel like I'm so, I know so much just being around it for so long that I have a lot to give yeah. and pass on to other people. Yeah, and you also have that experience of, you know, you, you talked about before being in high school learning how to 
critique tattoos, uh, or not tattoos, but art. I'm learning how to talk about art and then, you know, being around some other great tattoo artists. I'm sure that was a great experience for you. Just being, being taught the right way and being able to share that with other people. Yeah, absolutely. And, and now that I, I know, um, I have two apprentices and I make sure that their apprenticeship is a lot better than what I had to go through. Um, it's a hard tradition to break because there's so many people that still have difficult apprenticeships or not so great apprenticeships because they went through bad apprenticeships and it's tradition and now they're upset and they want to do that to other people. And I was like that for a little bit, but I I now realize like I need to help change the industry and um, I want to do my part and now give apprenticeships where all they have to do is clean some and, and draw, you know, yeah. most of the time. And I, I create a safe environment for them and for artists. I want to create a safe environment, safer than I've ever been at. Um, I, I just want other people to not have it as hard as I had it and to help change the, the industry. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I would love to talk about the apprenticeship program more, uh, but just kind of going back to the chronological order of things, you know, you, Went to the private studio, started doing some seminars. You're traveling, slow down a little bit. What made you decide to uh, go on and open your own studio? Um, I mean, a lot of it was you. Like, I, I know, like, that's what you you wanted to do. Yeah, but, I mean, you were, you were talking about opening up your own studio, you know, when we when we got together, even. Yeah. Um, I, and I it wasn't... It wasn't a thing that I was like, yeah, it's going to be set in stone and to do. Mm. Um, I, I think a lot of it was was um, you finding a passion in the tattoo community and, and realizing how much you could give and me being a good partner for that. Um, I think us together, um, I just, I, I knew that you would be really good at doing this too. Um, so when you left law school because you wanted to do this, I, I felt like, that it would succeed because you're really you're really good at everything you set your mind to and i think with the both of us we would create something good well thank you and i think we have um but i i know you and i remember you talking about you know kind of you felt like the next step for you was um was teaching and i feel like you know with your own studio now um you are i mean you're the you're the most experienced artist there um and I think you have a lot of great opportunities for um, teaching, not only in the apprenticeship program, but just um, day to day with the other artists. You know, you're, now you're the person that people come up to you and ask about their tattoo or what they can do better or change their design. I mean, do it's you, crazy. Yeah. Yeah. It is crazy. Yeah. To it's go crazy. from. It's so cool. Yeah. Do, do you feel like that's like uh, fulfilling to you or do you like that? It's, it's so fulfilling, you know, I, and also as, as thankful as I am for everything, there'll always be a part of me that's like, what's my next goal? What's my next thing? Um, at that point, I, I'm i not sure. I'm trying to figure that out. And it's a little scary because I always knew what I was going to do since yeah. I was six, 16. I knew what my goals were. And now what? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Like, I love teaching. and But also, like, what's outside of tattooing? Like, I, I don't know. There's... There's so much more to life, too, than your work and um, what you can do, you know. Family is also really important. I try to see my family a lot more now. I I, I build my relationship with you and um, just try to build relationships and and cherish the relationships I have. And, and yeah, so who knows what the, the next step is, but at this point, point in time I'm enjoying tattooing helping people um I've, I've now also decided I, I tattoo and reconstruct uh nipples on women um who have had double mastectomies I do it for free or for anybody you know trans people too whoever needs nipples I tattoo them for free I give those away and that that's meaningful for me um yeah so I just I just want to give back and give love and and love love my life and love things outside of tattooing as well yeah wonderfully said thank you well that uh that right there that seems like kind of a good place to uh to wrap up um thanks so much for 
talking about your your career. It's been it's been a hell of a career so far, and um, I I'm just honored to be a, you know a part of it. I'm really glad that I get to be with you, um, not only as your business partner but as your husband to see where you go next because it's been so great so far. I you know the sky's the limit for wherever you want to take it, and I'm excited for you to you know find out what you want to do next because I think well, that's going to be you. great too. You'll be here along for the ride with me. I well, love I'm, you. I'm, I love you too. I'm really looking forward to it. Well, thank you guys for tuning in. Um, yeah. Thank you, everybody, for listening to my whole story, my whole spiel. Yeah. Until next time, uh, I <laughs> I haven't really thought about how I want to end the podcast. But, uh, yeah, until next time. <laughs> sounds, sounds good right there, right? Sounds good. All right. Goodbye. <laughs>